I'll attempt to continue. Um, numbers of flowers per cluster, I talk about this in general. Um, just a quick anecdote here, um, a friend of mine is a consultant, he was working with a uh, greenhouse tomato grower, I believe in Ohio, um, and this greenhouse tomato grower was, you know, had had the Kool-Aid, he was on the system, he was taking his soil tests, he was doing his mineral balancing, he was doing his inoculation again, like my friend Liz, um, and he was doing what we call the uh, saturated paste test, which is the in-season soluble nutrient soil test, which tells you what's available right now for your plants, and he got his report back, and the report said uh, low on manganese, and so he said, well, I know what to do about this, took his manganese sulfate, he solubilized it in water, watered it into the soil, Felt really proud about him, you know, patted himself on the back. Um, went to bed that night, woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning. <gasps> I forgot to make the carbon. You know, he put 10 times as much manganese as he was supposed to. Um, there was no carbon. <laughs> he just put, he did the math wrong and put 10 times as much manganese in as he was supposed to. Um, and manganese is a soluble salt and too much trace elements will fry things and this was his cash crop and he got all worked up and he called my friend up and said, what can I do? And he's like, well, you've solubilized the salt and you've watered it into the soil. It's, <laughs> you can, sure, you can apply humic acid. You can put something in the buffer it, but, but you've definitely, you know, the, the train has left the station. Um, <laughs> we'll just have to see what occurs. Um, and what occurred was that the next time that tomato plant flowered, or those tomato plants flowered, instead of having four or five flowers per cluster, there were 12 to 15 flowers per cluster. Um, manganese is, you know, Carrie Reeves would call it a, a female element, uh, so it's a strong reproductive energy. Um, generally, when you see that the flowers are decreasing, the numbers of flowers are decreasing, that's actually correlated with a manganese deficiency. Um, these, this guy was on the program. He had, you know, good base calcium levels, he had good biological activity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those flowers all pollinated and set fruit, and functionally, he tripled his yield in that flowering cycle by overdosing his plants on manganese functionally. Because the plant had the capacity to deal with it, actually that manganese was a limiting factor. I've got written on the soil test, you know, on the, on the reports, 80 to 90 parts per million manganese, which is generally considered to be quite a high target. Um, it's not a high target if your plants are healthy because they need it to manifest the levels of fruiting, which is their potential. Anybody ever seen a cherry tomato cluster that had 100 fruit on it? Literally? like one frond, one frond with a hundred fruit on it. A friend of mine did this little experiment with overdosing plants on manganese, right? I, I, I say stuff like this and he's like, yeah, okay, Kittredge. So we took a handful of manganese sulfate and dumped it down at the end of the row of his tomatoes and said, let's see what happens, cherry tomatoes. And he sent me pictures of his cherry tomato plant with <laughs> literally more than a hundred fruit on a frond. <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. Yeah. There was definitely <laughs> anaerobic and they're tight. Yeah, 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 totally. Anyway, um, experimenting with these things is also a fun thing to do. Take a little bit of extra potassium, overdose one section of the field with it, and see what happens. That's another good way to learn yep. what happens. Um, you can you do it with a bucket. As I told you, just go throw a bucket out in a few days. If, it, you know, if you put down something that's soluble or whatever, like you'll, you'll know see. if it's wrong or it's right. Or, yeah. <laughs> if you've got, enough, you land, if you got, if you got enough, enough land to play with, yeah. right, the nature will tell you. You can send tissue tests off if you want, or you can just experiment, throw a little bit of this down here, throw a little bit of that down there, throw a little bit of this down here and see what happens. There's all kinds of ways to experiment. Um, if there was a good handbook on this whole topic, I would love, I would have, I would think I would have heard about it by now and I'd be happy to tell you. What I can tell you is there's an amazing amount of opportunity here and, and um, I have not been able to co coalesce it into much coherence. I'm giving you the best that I've got. We use the little, um, you know, the fertilizer, the conventional fertilizer thing that goes on your hose. So yeah. We'll just stick that on the hose or something and then just yeah. Yeah, play around with the diet. Spray some potassium down, spray some manganese down, spray some phosphorus down, spray some potassium down. You can totally do it. Um, what weed families are present? Not individual weeds, but general trends. Okay, fine. Um, all right, so now we get to the next few, few pages, which, which are uh, specific minerals and their specific symptoms. Um, before I read that, I want to read this one slide. Uh, biochemical process of plant nutrition. This comes from a guy named Hugh Lovell, uh, one of the better 
um, commentators on biodynamics that I've uh, come across. Hugh Lovell um, lives in, in um, Australia currently. He spent a lot of time farming in Georgia. Um, but A Biodynamic Farm and I think Quantum Agriculture are his two books that really go into a lot of, a lot of these things. And, but bio, from a biodynamic perspective, for those who are curious about biodynamics, um, I, I think it's the best book I've ever read on biodynamics was a, a Biodynamic Farm, a good comprehensive conversation. And then Quantum Ag really integrates the mineral balancing with the energetics. Um, really interesting book for those who are looking for Quantum Agriculture. Hugh Lovell, L-O-V-E-L -L is his name. I think they're both published by Acres USA Press. I think they've set up a certification for Quantum now, right? To rival Demeter? Is it? I think so. I don't know. I saw him give it a three-day course last month, and I, he didn't okay. say anything about that. I might be wrong, then. Um, there's discussions of it. They're trying to push the envelope. Various people are trying to push the envelope with different labels, but I don't know if there's anything formal about it. Um, there's this regenerative conversation going on, too. People are talking about regenerative agriculture. Right. Yeah. Vermont has a certified regenerative now. Is it certified, or is somebody proposing something? Yeah, it just went through. It passed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, Siskiyou Seeds uh, that we mentioned yesterday is a, a biodynamic seed. Yeah, for what it's worth. Okay, boron activates silicon, which carries all other nutrients, starting with calcium, which binds nitrogen to form amino acids, DNA, and promotes cell division. Amino acids form proteins and tag trace minerals, especially magnesium, to form chlorophyll, which transfers energy via phosphorus to carbon, to form sugars, which grow up potassium carries them. I don't know if anybody else finds that a bit overwhelming. Um, the one point I want to make by reading that is that everything's That's connected cool. to everything else. Everything's connected to everything else. So we can talk about calcium deficiencies, but the first bullet point in the calcium deficiency says, oftentimes calcium shortages show up in tandem with other shortages, most commonly boron and silicon. The first line in this previous slide, boron activates silicon, which carries all other nutrients starting with calcium. If you don't have enough calcium in the plant, but you've got enough calcium in the soil, the issue may not be to add more calcium because it's not, the calcium doesn't bring, doesn't carry itself. It's the boron which facilitates the calcium mobility. Generally, when you see this big leaf at the bottom of the plant and small leaves at the top of the plant, that's a symptom of calcium deficiency, which is not caused by a lack of calcium. It's caused by a lack of boron. It's the boron which facilitates the calcium mobility. Even if you've got enough calcium in the soil, it's Boron, which is the issue in so many cases, I just, I, it can be, it can be, but in almost everyone's case, boron is deficient. Yeah. Just about everybody's case, so boron is deficient. Yeah. Every single case, boron is deficient. Let me say that three more times. In every single case, boron is deficient. You don't need, if you're not going to take a soil test, you mean well, but you know you're not going to follow through. Get your hands on some boron and get it out there in the ground. Just about everybody needs boron. Maybe in a hoop house, you don't. Maybe in a place where it doesn't rain, you don't. If you've applied boron in the past. But I'm nervous about it. You, keep you should be you, nervous about if it. If you put too much boron on it, yes. it just grew. But mm -hmm. you've had it. Yep. Because it's not going to come back out. It's just going to. So I've really been it, nervous it, about it's boron. It's an anion, I I boron. and it leaches. So it's just that. If your plant tissues have it in it, and if you, you know. I'll teach you how to, I'll give you a, a test for, for boron deficiency yeah, in a minute. Yeah. I'll give you a test for boron deficiency. You can use it with, with a refractometer in a minute. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, so we're all deficient, but what do we need to be at? I mean, mine says 0 0.27. 0 .0. I gave you a target of three yesterday on the, on the handout. Oh, that's So right. you are formally at about 10% of where you need to be, which means your yields will never pass 10% of what the genetic potential of your crops are. Do we have the thing that you read aloud that started with boron carries all other nutrients by account? Yeah. You yeah. should. Yeah. Top of page four. We're moving right along here. Yeah. Yeah. Top of page four. That smells. Um, stem and leaf strength and ability to flex and bend are correlated to calcium. When things are brittle, you don't have enough calcium. Mm -hmm. Strong cell walls which correlate to fungal resistance happen when you've got good calcium levels. If you've got fungal susceptibility, if you've got, if your you know, blights and mildews are taking your crops out, you are not getting enough calcium into your plant. Roundness of stem is a sign of good calcium presence. Leaves that have a wrinkled appearance and may defoliate are a sign of a calcium deficiency. Anybody ever seen a, a green Swiss chard leaf? You know, the four-hook giant green chard starts off in the spring with this big, beautiful, broad, glossy leaf. 
sometimes by the middle of July it's got all ruffled. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that ruffle? It was flat, now it's not. Yep. The ruffling is a sign of a calcium deficiency. Have you ever seen a ruffle on the, the side of, on a corn leaf? We were looking at kinks. Oh. A corn leaf with a little ruffle going up one side yeah, and down the next? Like yeah, that <laughs> ruffling, that, that savoying is a sign of a calcium deficiency. And twisting. Yeah. Twisting. It's, it's, I guess it leaves it twisting. yeah. Poorly developed root hairs. You don't usually dig up your plants to see what the root hairs look like. Um, young leaves that die back at the tips. Also a sign of calcium deficiency. Adequate calcium correlates to the same leaf size across the plant. When the leaves get smaller and smaller, that's a functional calcium deficiency. Adequate calcium will help the plant vibrate at a higher frequency, increasing the plant's ability to pull nutrients to it. Um, you can take that one or leave it. I think it's true, but it's hard to test. Um, leaves will curl upward in the calcium shortage in cucurbits and become brittle. This also correlates with a boron deficiency. Vine crops will become resistant to powdery mildew with sufficient silicon. Anybody ever had their winter squash leaves turn white and then turn brown and then die? That's called powdery mildew. Ever had your summer squash leaves do that? Ever had your cucumber leaves do that? That's called powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. right, you, will, you, will have you will not have susceptibility to powdery mildew with sufficient silicon. Um, silicon and calcium are needed to build strong cell walls, which are impenetrable to fungal hyphae. They cannot mm -hmm. penetrate the cell wall with a strong, with a, good, a properly built cell wall. With, um, they simply can't do it, and mm -hmm. silicon is critical for that purpose. Um, I gave you the target level of 50 on the soil test as, a, as for silicon. I suggest that when your soil test levels are below, are below 50, it's a good excuse to use some rock dust. Um, anybody know what a good biological form of silicon is? Horse tail. Horse tail. Equisetum, horse tail. Uh, you can take and make a horse tail tea. It's a wonderful way to get a, a really biologically available form of silicon. You can spray it into your plants. You can water it into your plants. Really wonderful. Horsetail is a very, very primitive plant. It doesn't have leaves. It's like 90. You can get that now. You can buy horsetail. They aren't really leaves. They're like uh, silicon. Silicon is, uh, well, uh, calcium and silicon are critical for building strong cell walls. And the calcium is moved by the boron. It's the boron that's the death of you. It's the boron that's the death of you. It's the boron. Boron is massively important. Massively important. Sure, you should be afraid of putting on too much. It can be, it's a wonderful weed killer. It's your organic farmer's herbicide. If you've got a patio where you've got grass growing in the patio and you want to kill it, a little bit too much borax will take it out good. Right? What do they use for pressure treating wood these days? Boron. Right? Some, boron some is... Well, a lot of it is, is, is boron. One if you've got a patio yeah, with grass growing in between the... Too much boron is a really good killer. So you should be afraid of it. You should be concerned about it. Absolutely. But I've given you recommendations for quantities that are not too much. Right? Um, and generally, having a good calcium level in your soil will buffer against almost everything. And good organic matter levels in the soil will buffer against almost everything. Um, and whenever you're worried about a, something burning things, you mix it with a carbon source. And that'll prevent it from, from burning things. Humates have a very good source of available silicon in I did not know that. What does? Humates. Oh, humates. All right. Um, grasses and cucurbits especially need silicon. Silicon supplementation will cause leaf hairs to increase in size and vibrancy. Um, anybody knows about leaf hairs? Hairs, leaves on, ha hair, leaves with hairs on them. Um, some tomato leaves have are hairy and fuzzy. Some tomato mm -hmm. leaves are not. Some eggplants build this thorn on them that you can like draw blood. Some eggplants don't have anything on them. The fuzzier the plant, the better. The hairier, the better. The more the stem looks like it'll prickle you, the healthier the plant is. Right? In general, those are functionally antenna. Boron facilitates carbohydrate transport down to the roots and nutrients up to the leaves. Insufficient boron will correlate with a stagnant bricks reading in crops that does not fluctuate during the day. All right, time for a picture. Is 
Equisitum of a uh, hydric plant. It looks like a, I, I don't, yeah, I've never grown it or anything, so I just looked it up and it looks aquatic. No, it grows in very dry areas, like along the railroad track. Yeah, so really very piles, piles of it's a very dry rock. Prehistoric type so of we plant. could grow it ourselves. <laughs> you can find it, you can find it growing around. I just found it last week in a farm. Cool. cool. I'm going to ask them if I can go back and harvest it somewhere. <laughs> I don't see much of it around. I've seen it. In, I've seen it in piles of, you know, rock dust and sand and stuff like that. Is where I've seen it growing. But you said you saw it growing in the wetlands. Yeah. What is it? Horsetail. It's called. Oh, okay. Okay. There's it's a, a very, very, very primitive plant. It's like a 500 million year old plant. It doesn't really have leaves. It looks like a pine tree in its shape. It doesn't. It's like it's got needles, but they aren't needles there. Okay. Because that kind of plants and ferns that probably made these humate deposits, and that's probably why they're high in silicon. That's and the ferns from those deposits were 80 feet tall. Yeah. Those are real full-on ferns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Imagine what we could do with a little bit more global warming and some good nutrition. Yeah. We could cause all of our plants to grow like that. We really could. Right? How big yeah. were the dinosaurs? I mean, like, yeah. we could, if we figure out how to use biological systems, like, well, we could do amazing things. Yeah. We can modulate plants. It's going to get really exciting. I think it's, oh. All right. So I was going to talk about bricks. Um, so I gave you the picture for the, for the conductivity before, and I said you'd like to see it generally move up and maintain through the growing season, and when it goes down, there's a sign something's wrong, and you should get in there and, and work on your conductivity. This is a 24-hour cycle here on, uh, with a refractometer and bricks. Um, so we'll call this 7 a.m. We'll call this 3 p.m. And this is 7 a.m. again. You should have a one to two point differential between these two. I should probably tell you what BRICS is first <laughs> before we get too far down this road. Um, and if you don't, if you don't get this kind of a path, if you check it at 7 a.m. And, and 3 p.m. and 7 a.m., if you don't get this up and down, if you get something that looks like this, you where your BRICS down. reading is like this, try it, wait for a sunny day if you want to test it. Yeah. Um, if your BRICS reading is stagnant, that means you've got a boron deficiency. Real simple. Okay, what is BRICS? What is refractometer? Why is it important? People have heard about it. I haven't talked about it. This is a refractometer. Um, uh, Let's we'll start with BRICS. BRICS was a Austrian chemist. He, was, he won the award put out by the German vintners in the 1830s. The German vintners had this issue, which was that they... Um, we were trying to make wine because they were vintners, and they kept making vinegar. Um, they would take their, harvest their grapes, you know, crush them, ferment them, stick them in the barrels, stick the barrels in the catacombs, pull the barrels out 20 years later, and they'd be full of vinegar. And they were like, oh! <laughs> right? And it just kept happening. Because barrels are big, and you know, they cost money to make, and the catacombs are holes in the ground that are a hassle to dig out. And it's, you know, they were hoping to get wine in their barrels and they kept finding vinegar in their barrels and sometimes they'd be wine and sometimes they'd be vinegar and they couldn't figure out what made them sometimes be vinegar and sometimes be, be wine. And so they all got together and they made a you know million dollar prize. They said whoever it wasn't a million dollars obviously, but whoever can figure out how to predict what grape juice will make wine and what grape juice will make vinegar, we will give this prize to. And Bricks is the guy who figured it out. Bricks figured out that it was a specific gravity of the juice that correlates with the quality of the wine. The more viscous, the more dense, the more stuff in the juice, the better the quality of the wine. The more watery the juice, the more likely it would turn into vinegar and not to wine. Um, he won the award, and he got a little chart named after him. People may have heard of Richter. You may have heard of um, Fahrenheit. You may have heard of um, Celsius, right? You know about all these guys? Right? They were just European men from the 1800s who figured something out and got a chart named after them, or a scale named after them. So Bricks is another one of those European men from the 1800s who got a scale named after him, and that's called the Bricks scale, the Bricks chart. Um, there's oftentimes a misunderstanding when it comes to Bricks, and people think that Bricks is testing sugar, and that is absolutely categorically entirely not true. So I want to explain to you what Bricks is testing um, and why we think it's important when it comes to crops. It is not a be-all and end-all, but I think it is one of the simplest, easiest, least expensive modes for analysis of how your crops are doing 
if you're being intellectually honest. Um, so what refractometer is measuring is refraction. Refraction is the bending of light. Um, if you stick your hand in a bathtub full of water, it'll look like it bends. We know this. It's not bending. It's just the light that's bending when it passes through the water. If you stick your hand in the ocean, it'll look like it bends more. It's not more bent. It's that the light is bending more when it's passing through the water with salt in it. The salt in the water causes the light to bend more than it would if it was just passing through water. Um, there's no sugar in the ocean. The light is bending. We're getting, we're getting a bricks reading in the, in the salt water. There's no sugar. You can, so what a refractometer measures is how much the light bends when it passes through a fluid. When you put one drop of water on here, you should see it go to zero. That's zero bricks is pure water. Um, the calibration to bricks is a sucrose calibration. So the amount light bends when it passes through a 1% sucrose solution is called one bricks. The amount light bends when it passes through a 5% sucrose solution is called five bricks. The amount light bends when it passes through a 10% sucrose solution is 10 bricks. That's the calibration. Like Celsius is 1% is of, of the, you know, distance between frozen water and boiling water, right? Frozen water is, freezing water is zero Celsius and boiling water is 100 Celsius, but the air is not boiling. But when we say 70 Celsius or 60 Celsius or 40 Celsius, we're not measuring the temperature of water. It's just that the scale is set to that. And then once we've got the scale, we know what that means. So, um, so the way you get a bricks reading on a crop is really simple. And what you're measuring is what are all the juices in the crop. And basically, the more stuff in the juice, the more minerals, um, the more amino acids, the more proteins, the more, you know, all these nitrates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the sap, the more the light bends when it passes through it. Certainly sugar is one of the compounds in the sap that's causing light to, light to bend, but it's not the only one. So we're not measuring sugar. You can put a drop of vinegar on a refractometer and get a reading. You can get a drop of you know, um, olive oil on the refractometer and get a reading. Drop of battery acid on the refractometer and get a reading. None of those have, well, none of them have sugar in them, and all of them give you a reading which makes the point that you're not testing sugar. So anybody who tells you that a refractometer is testing sugar is lying to you or is ignorant or is you know, being disingenuous of the best. I know a lot of people who know better who, keep, who tell people that a refractometer measures sugar and it's not true. Cool. Minor pet peeve. Just about the bricks nutrition yeah. analysis, like that we were getting high bricks yeah. on some of the plants and the animals were not performing well and that Nitrates or things like I just I also know it was parallel in the mineral mineral maybe in the solution, but it doesn't mean the minerals were imbalanced. Like if one mineral yes. in excess, it could be a high bricks. You got a you got an anaerobic situation and you got toxicities of certain elements and yeah. the and the animals are not responding so, well. Uh, the grazers are also just use the bricks and everyone's thinking yeah. higher is better, and I'm like, well I'm just kind of trying to understand it. So I can explain so, to a better like it it's generally a good sign, but it can it doesn't mean it's healthy, you know, it just means... So there's cloudy, line, there's cloudy line bricks and flat line bricks. That's one, that's one nuance I should go into. And then there's, there's the overall numbers. So uh, first the thing I want to do is I want to show you how to get a bricks reading. And then we can go into other nuances. So um, what I suggest you do when you're growing your plants um, is one thing you can do is you can take a bricks reading, you know, every morning, at, every Tuesday morning at 7 when you're take, taking your walk. Get your refractometer in one pocket and your conductivity meter in the other. Take a bricks reading, you take a leaf, you put it in here, you squish it, and here comes a drop of juice. It's that easy. And you look at it, and we've got about a seven and a half or so. Mm -hmm. You see it? That's yours, you've probably seen it before. Um, look toward the light. What's that? Does she need to look toward the light? Uh, it's bright enough in here. Um, I just had a question about stored food or produce because like, sometimes yeah. I wonder if I could take samples and then by the time I walk back it might be an hour like yeah. I don't have a meter with me or something. I see something on the sample like with those leaves that have been here for their day. Or two, in water. How yeah. much do you expect? I mean, is it, so is bricks, it predictable how much it would lose over time? Um, bricks is really good if you're being intellectually honest. And there's really easy ways to cheat bricks. Like if you dehydrate a leaf, 
right? I mean, you can take a leaf fresh and you can get a brick reading on it, it'll be four. And if you let it wilt for an hour, the brick reading will be six. So, or, or eight. The more wilted something is, the more the water has left it, the more the dissolved solids are concentrated, the higher the reading gets. So bricks, if you want to cheat, is really, I mean, is doable. You can cheat bricks. It's not, it's not hard to do. If you're being intellectually honest, if, you're, if you really are trying to be, you know, empirical and get a baseline and see where things are moving, it's a valuable tool. This is, there's no battery in this thing, right? If you go on to, you know, Amazon or one of those things on the internet, you can find these things for 25 bucks, right? You can use it 10,000 times. So what's right. the best time to take a reading? Then? Getting there. There's so many yeah. good questions here. <laughs> Depends on whether you want to impress people or you want to be honest with yourself. If you want to impress people, you do it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If you want to be honest with yourself, you do it at 7 o'clock in the morning. The bricks should be lowest in the morning because all day long the plant is going through photosynthesis and making sugar and, and all night long those sugars okay. are being dropped, dropped into the soil. So a lot of the nutrients should be dropped into the soil at night and if they're not, that means that the carbohydrate transport down to the roots is not functioning. Boron facilitates carbohydrate transport down to the roots and nutrients up to the leaves. What's that? If it's straight, you've got a boron deficiency. I call this constipation. I call it constipation. Other minerals that we need, I'll go back to what in him with this boron pathway too. Like it's not just boron if it's black, right? It's not only possible boron. Yeah. Um this I mean that's a really good guess. There's all kinds of things that could be going on. Uh, basically what I've got here are rules of thumb that I've learned from people who know more than I do. Um, and they've tried this out and they speak fairly confidently. So I'm simply conveying yeah, words from the elders. Go somewhere else. You can use 20 mule team borax. 20 mule team borax. If you can get it for cheap, absolutely. Yep. Um, I use uh, boric acid or solubor, which I can usually get for 60 or so bucks for a 50 pound bag. And it's twice as concentrated as, as borax. There's twice as much boron and. and, and um, there's a bunch of conversations going on around here. People got really excited and started talking about bricks. Yep. <clears throat> Either that or they needed a brick. Having looked at that, is that, would you consider that a, um, a fuzzy line or a clear line? Um, I would say that's not a clear line. It's more fuzzy than clear. Yeah, when you've got a clear line, it's really clear. There's like a, it's almost like a straight line. And that's what you, you got want? one there? No, you do not want a clear line, you want a fuzzy line. A clear line generally connotes um, simpler compounds, and a fuzzy compound connotes uh, complex compounds. The bigger the compound, the more fractal the structure, the more, the more broadly the light is refracted. The simpler the compound, the less the light is refracted, the more simple the, the angle of bend is. A nitrate is a simple compound. Sugar is a simple compound. So, in general, just to keep going here on the bricks, amino acids are, are they're more simple than protein. Protein would be would be com would be complex. Be more complex. Yes. And what's your experience been with rain? So you walk out on the morning at 7 a.m. and you had an inch of rain overnight. Would you expect yeah. conductivity to change, bricks to change a lot? Um, so conductivity. So a couple couple points here I want to make from this. Um, um, that I haven't said yet, that I usually like to say. When it rains, people know about leaching, right? So nutrients, soluble nutrients in solution will leach when it rains. Um, when it's cloudy and rainy for a while, and a lot of nutrients leach out, what would you, that would, that's a symptom, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common situation. We'll, cut, we'll get into a weather, pa weather pattern where it'll be cloudy and rainy. When it's cloudy, there's no sun. When there's no sun, Photosynthesis doesn't happen very much. When photosynthesis doesn't happen very much, there's not much food for the soil life. When it's raining, what nutrients are available are being leached out. So if you had a situation where you had all of your nutrition being leached out of your system, too much fluid running through your system, all your nutrients being leached out, what would you call that if you were a human? 
Diarrhea. I call it diarrhea. A bad case would be called giardia, or there's other words for it, right? Um, dysentery. How many thousand people are die a year because of a bad case of diarrhea? Tens of thousands, if not more. Hundreds of thousands, right? I mean, there's a, somebody a few years ago realized that what happens when you have a bad case of diarrhea is all your nutrients are being leached out of your system, and they figured a 10 cent packet that can save children's lives. You know what's in it? Sugar and salt. Salt and sugar will maintain electrolytes, which will keep the system going when otherwise it'd be leached out. So therefore, if it's cloudy and rainy, and the electrolytes are being leached out of the system, what could you use to keep things going until the system gets back into gear? Sugar and salt. Sugar and salt. A little bit of molasses, a little bit of seawater. A little bit of molasses, a little bit of seawater is a wonderful prophylactic during a time when it's cloudy and rainy for too long. In 2009, when, when late blight came through, it was a cloudy, rainy, cold spring. It just would not stop being cloudy and rainy, and the plants were getting sick because they were hungry. They were hitting puberty, they were getting pregnant, and they weren't getting fed. What happens when you've got a pregnant teenager who's not getting fed? Nothing pretty. Nothing pretty happens. So what do you do? You feed the mother. You keep her alive until the weather changes. That's all we did. Sugar, molasses, and seawater, we literally watered them into the row, and we didn't get blight. Right? It's so simple. Uh, we just use molasses and well, I think we had some dry, sh some uh, straight up sugar too. I got a five pound box of white sugar, you five pound bag of white sugar. Do you use liquid molasses or the dry? Um, either one. The, the dry, I went ahead and got because I had yeah. so much trouble with this whole liquid molasses thing. Yeah. Nasty. If you can buy organic sugar, you organic cane organic sugar, organic, organic molasses, molasses, dried molasses for cow feed. You can buy organic molasses for human feed. Someone has the propionic acid. You can, you can get straight up, in cases like this, I don't get bothered with details. Personally, um, you know, we buy a 50 pound bag of you know, organic cane sugar and it sits in the box and we use it over the next two years. You can pull a pound or two out of that and put it in a, couple, in a bucket of water and put it through the irrigation system and you've got sugar in the system. You take some, you know, a, a handful of sea salt and you put it in that bucket of water with the, with the salt, with the sugar, and you, and you put it into the system, water into the system, and you keep your plants alive and flourishing in a cold, cloudy, rainy two, three weeks when everybody else's plants are crashing and burning. Can you foliar feed that? What's that? Can you foliar feed it? You could foliar feed it, but the issue is the conductivity of the soil is low. Okay. And you know, you can maybe, you can put, you can put le much less into the system through the foliar than you can put through the irrigation system. I like to say if your conductivity is low, the issues in the soil, if the bricks is low, work on the leaf. Right? If your conductivity is low, you're not going to get high bricks. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure you got good conductivity in the soil before you even bother yourself with a refractometer reading. Practically. Molasses is a lot easier if you start it in hot water. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, look. No. Um, you could do a quart to a gallon of molasses per acre. Um, you know, one to five pounds of sugar. Um, Depending on the uh, seawater, um, if you've got a conductivity meter, um, that's helpful because then you can see it's, you're getting the conductivity really from the sh from the salt. But you could put down, you know, 10 gallons of salt water at least on an acre, if not more. Um, uh, but you use your conductivity meter, stick it in the ground. If you got if your conductivity is 30, and you put down 10 gallons of seawater on the acre, and it goes up to 50, then you could probably put a bunch more. Uh, look at your soil test in the past and see where your sodium levels are. If your sodium levels are really low anyways, feel free to overdose it. Um, a little bit of salt water goes a long way. It's really quite exciting and there's a whole bunch of it available or almost next to nothing. People know about salt water. Talk so about one to five pounds of sugar per acre, ten gallons of salt water per acre. Is a really Sorry. conservative, it's a conservative baseline. You're not going to fry anything with that kind of application rate. One to five pounds of sugar. Right? Of sugar. Yes. And how about dead sea salt? I've heard that it is, what did you say it was? Magnesium, magnesium chloride. chloride. molasses. If you need magnesium, you need chlorine. We have everything we need available in all kinds of different forms. 
And if it comes to you, here's the thing, right? Something comes to you, you feel like, I don't know why I keep thinking about this. Maybe they're telling you. Don't ask somebody else. Right. If it keeps coming to you, trust right. that it's coming to you. Don't doubt yourself. People who get these connections are also like they've been, they've been just over, over their lifetimes, they've been told they're wrong and they've been told to shut up and all kinds of other horrible things. And they don't trust themselves. And these are the people that we would have called you know, the shamans in previous generations. Those people who have that direct connection were the ones that were honored deeply and respected. In, in other cultures. Those are the ones that we make fun of and we lock up in mental institutions now. Literally. Right? People that hear voices, that hear the plants talking to them. Right? I mean, you are officially SSI for the rest of your life. Social Security, right? You are considered to be crazy. If you said you heard the plants talk to you once in front of a psychologist, you are legitimately eligible for SSI for the rest of your life. You are crazy. You cannot function in this society. That is the law. Right? That's the law. That's the way the system is working. Sorry. I go on rants every now and then. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Sounds like a really good plan. Somebody told me this one 15 years ago, and I was like, 600 bucks a month. You know? I don't know. That's thin. That's a little thin. Well, they, yeah. All right, may I proceed? We have an hour and a half till we're done, and we're on page five. Just saying. If you're in a crisis, if you're in a crisis situation, like the, everybody else's plants are getting sick and it's been raining for a while, you put it on, then test, and put it on, then test in real time. In general, a monthly, uh, in general, a weekly basis would be a good time to be monitoring. I just want to say, give me that formula again. Which one? I hate giving formulas. I'm sorry. It's not about formulas. Ask your plants how much they want. Can you tell me how you would typically put it in a quart, a quart per gallon. A quart, a quart to a gallon of molasses. Between a quart and a gallon of molasses per acre, I said. Oh, I thought you said you Do put you a mix quart in a gallon. Do you with something when you're... Water. Just the water. A quart to a gallon of molasses per acre or a pound to five pounds of sugar per acre will give you the sugar in the salt and sugar piece. I said ten gallons of seawater per acre will give you the salt piece in the salt and sugar piece. You put the two together, and the molasses buffers the salt. If you put too much molasses down, it'll stimulate the soil life, and they'll eat your plant roots. All things in moderation. If you put too much molasses down, I gave you numbers because you want numbers. There's a range. That's the range. Five gallons of molasses per acre might stimulate your soil life to such a degree that they begin to eat your plant roots. Yep. You put a whole bunch of molasses down when you put your transplants in, and they will literally eat the roots off your transplants yep. per acre. A little, little dab will do you, right? Less is more. Air on the side of conservatism. Slow and steady wins the race. There's a bunch of more metaphors, I'm sure, but they all get to that basic point. I think the dried molasses would be equal to the dried sugar. Close enough. I don't know. How's that? I know nothing. Why you guys are asking me questions? You've never seen my farm. There's your problem. Suckers. A whole bunch of suckers. Reel them in. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I'll show you my invoice book. I, I'll show you the check when that comes in. That, that part's true. That part's true. <clears throat> and it's the what, second week in April or something. That's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. And it was eight degrees out like a week and a half ago. That was cold. And we got six inches of snow. But that was outside the hoop houses, not inside the hoop houses. Um, all right. So if too much rain and and the conductivity being leached out is a case of diarrhea, um, what happens when 
the sugar is stuck in a leaf and can't make it down to the roots. I call it constipation. Right? Nothing's, nothing's flowing, nothing's moving, everything's backed up. So when everything's backed up, there's no food going down here, there's no food coming up here, the whole system backs up. Right? Boron deficiency is foundational in full system collapse for most crops most years, I think. Boron deficiency, it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing how simple and how regular and just categorical it is, yes? So I do a lot of site consults and yeah. boron is not something I've been fluent in. Yes. And this is explaining like so many things. It's yes. embarrassing how so simple. So what, um, what does somebody like me do when I've got a client who's kind of got their income on the line and they're seeing all kinds of these problems and I'm like, okay, this is a boron problem. And I also know that boron is one of the things you need to be careful about not. So how, to, what's the safest way to do an emergency application? Um, so, does that not exist? Oh, it exists. Yeah, it exists. <laughs> um, but generally, boron deficiencies are, you know, I mean, correlate with calcium deficiencies and silicon deficiencies. And so, um, what I use in this kind of situation is, I mean, Jerry Brunetti. I keep going back to Jerry Brunetti because he was one of the brilliant elders and really, unfortunately, recently passed. Um, put together a whole suite of liquid products that are in the jug, off the shelf, totally inexpensive, a quart to the acres application rate, and he's got a liquid calcium, which is boron, silicon, and calcium with a bunch of other goodies. It's funny because I, you know, just a couple weeks ago before I even knew about this class, I found that website trying to figure this shit, this out, yeah. sorry, and just couldn't really navigate through all of what he was doing. You can't things. navigate it because he was too crazy smart. Uh -huh. And like he couldn't, he forgot how to communicate with people. Yeah. Yeah. He start going. He start going. Boom. He's off. <laughs> <laughs> he goes off the right. Oh, he's off there again. You're like Jerry. Oh, I had a question. I had a question, but he's gone. He's off. He was a brilliant individual. Jerry Brunetti. Yeah. Farm as ecosystem is the book that he wrote before he passed. Um, the one, the calcium one with the board is called Calcentials. Farm as ecosystem. Thinking of your farm as a whole ecosystem was the idea. Um, Cal Essentials is one of them, and then the other product that he's got is called, um, uh, mm, what's it called? It was a trace element one, a trace element concentrate. These are, he, before he died, he said, I love the work that your organization is doing. I would love to make all these products available to your members, so anybody who's a member of the organization can get them at the dealer price. Full stop, end of conversation. All these liquids are available for members at dealer price. This was like a special deal because he said, what you guys are doing is entirely in <coughs> line with what I want to have happen. So um, anyway, for what it's worth, I think that's a wonderful offer. So if you want to sign up to the number right now. <laughs> 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 reel them in, reel them in. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, you can make it yourself. Really, all you have to do is take your, your solubor and any kind of, you know, I, I personally use liquid humates. Um, you can use humic acid, you can use fulvic acid. Um, you know, you basically want to be taking that trace element and you want to be buffering it. Um, you can water it into the soil, you can apply it as a foliar spray. Foliar spray, you're talking about, you know, a few ounces per acre. Um, watering into the ground, maybe a, couple, maybe a little bit more than that. You're not talking about significant application rates. Really. You want to be doing this stuff systemically. You want to be doing it in the fall. You want to be putting it into the compost pile. You don't want to be doing crisis management. You want to be doing proactive monitoring and management. You really want to be proactive about stuff as much as possible. It's really, I mean, people don't deal with stuff until they're in crisis. In many cases, some, for some reason, pain is our greatest teacher. But um, we could get to a point where we're proactive and we prevent these things systemically in the first place. Um, anyway. All right, I am definitely running out of time, and I'm going to push the envelope here on speed, if you guys will bear with me. Uh, sulfur, old leaves don't turn yellow and don't drop. Um, uh, anybody ever seen that on a um, broccoli plant? Um, Brussels sprout on a uh, leek or an onion or a garlic. Bottom leaves turn yellow and sit there. <clears throat> Bottom leaves turn yellow and sit there. Seen that? My do this. What's that? My daily do that, and I have low sulfur. 
Bottom, bottom leaves turn yellow and sit there is, is a sulfur deficiency, classic sulfur deficiency. Phosphorus and nitrogen, I've got not very much here, and you guys probably can find more about those two elements in other locations. So read what you've got if you want. I'm going to move on to potassium where I've got more to offer. I think potassium is another one of the major limiting factors, another one of the critical elements that short circuits things in general through the growing season. Um, potassium is a transport element, catalyst in plant sizing. Lack of potassium will show up in the leaf and the stem, fruit and the stem if the size is not there. Obviously, in the size and shape of fruit, the shape of a red delicious apple is this shows the shape of a, a potassium deficiency. If you've ever picked a cucumber that was full on one end and pinched on the bottom, that's a potassium deficiency. If you've ever picked a summer squash or a zucchini that was full at the stem end and, and, and pinched at the bottom, that's a potassium deficiency. If you've ever had your cherry tomatoes get smaller and smaller and smaller through the growing season, that's a potassium deficiency. Your regular tomatoes, if you've had your squashes, you know, um, winter squashes, your potatoes don't fill out. They don't bulk up like they should. That's a potassium deficiency. Potassium is critical in these things filling out, bulking out. Um, thin stems, thin calyxes, thin leaves, and small fruit are symptoms of potassium deficiency. In a vine crop, it'll be a light or yellow band around the outside rim of the leaf. Have you ever seen a little yellow band around the outside of a cucumber leaf? It's a potassium deficiency. Um, in tomatoes, bottom leaves that curl up, that turns into early blight is potassium deficiency. Early blight is that classic disease that I remember since childhood happening every year where the bottom leaves on tomato plants turn yellow, and they turn brown, and, they turn, and then they fall off. Have you ever seen that one? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes people do this job where they take the, the plant turns yellow, the bottom leaves turn yellow, and they pull them off. Ever done that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. the next leaf <laughs> turns yellow, and you, what do you do? Pull, pull, and then the next leaf? I, I've got a friend, sweetheart, Italian, grows tomatoes in a soup house, brought me into a soup house one year, 15 foot tall, amazing <laughs> cherry tomato plant, butt naked. <laughs> pulled off every single leaf. Turn yellow, pull them off. Turn yellow, pull them off. I'm like, Sammy, we've been over this. <laughs> when the soil dries out, the potassium availability drops off, and the plant sacrifices her body to feed her babies. We've talked about this. The leaves turning yellow is not a disease. It's she's hungry, and she's sacrificing her body to feed her babies. You've heard about this, right? Potassium deficiency is foundational in a lot of these systemic issues that occur uh, in fruiting plants especially. The best way to get a potassium deficiency is to let your soil dry out. <clears throat> potassium is an electrolyte. Um, when your soil dries out, the potassium that's available ties back up into the soil colloid. It will only take two to three months to re-release that potassium once the soil is hydrated again. <clears throat> two to three months is most of your growing season. Let your soil dry out once, and you're up the creek for the next two to three months. Wow. <clears throat> I keep my drip tape down most of the year. If we get one of those nice dry Aprils, I'm irrigating my unplanted field because I don't want um, May and June and July to be you know, having potassium deficiencies in my crops. I understand that maintaining hydration through the entire growing season is critical. I want to keep the life in the soil alive even when there's nothing growing. Maintaining hydration is actually a really important thing to do, um, if nothing else, for the actual your yield. If you're growing anything that bulks out, the yield is, you, you know, you get paid on weight. Until people learn about quality, you're getting paid on weight. Right? You don't have enough potassium, the crops don't fill out. That's why your crops get, get are pinched and small and don't have the bulk they should have. And in most cases, it's due to a lack of water is the foundational issue, is your potassium deficiency issue. All right. How, how dry does it have to get? Is there an easy way to measure that if they, you're not getting to that? Point? My standard for water is, can I put my hand in the soil and pick up a handful of it and feel moisture? Will it hold together? If it doesn't hold together, if I don't feel moisture, it's too dry. I want to maintain hydration in the entire field through the entire growing season. I understand that water is important for life. Right? If the soil does not feel moist, it's not wet. Wait for it. Whoa! <laughs> if you can't feel moisture, it's not wet. It's, you know this. You were just saying it so I would say it for everybody else. Not entirely. <laughs> you disagree. What's that? Not entirely. Not entirely. 
Just checking to see if you know what you're up to, kid. <clears throat> um, magnesium is used to is produce chlorophyll, which turns the plant sap a deep true green. High levels of magnesium will cause a very dark plant sap, which shows a healthy plant. Um, if I had squished a leaf and seen that lack of a dark color, magnesium would be the first one I'd go for. First one I'd go for. What happens if you don't have that dark color? It means you don't have much chlorophyll. If you don't have much chlorophyll, that means you don't have much sugar being made. If you don't have much sugar being made, then what, then what does that mean? The whole system is starving. It doesn't matter what color the leaf is. Squish the leaf and look at the color of the sap. You want so dark that it looks black. Any color leaf. Full stop. It's the juice in the leaf that you want to be dark. Yes. The leaf, I mean, different plants have different colors of, of pigments. But the sap, I mean, the, 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 chlor the, the chlorophyll is chlorophyll. Just like human blood. Yeah. Some people are brown, some people are black, some people are yellow, but the blood is still red. Mm -hmm. Hemoglobin, heme, is almost exactly the same, same molecule as chlorophyll. People know that? Yep. You take the iron out and you put the magnesium yep. in and you've, got the, and you've, got, you've gone from, from, from heme to chlorophyll. That's it. That's why I really love Totally interesting. Totally interesting. <laughs> or you could just stop and go out and talk to your plants and everything will be fine. Yeah, good. We'll keep do, do that more. All right. Magnesium, we've got cobalt, copper, iron, manganese. I don't have much on these. Um, those who really want to delve deeply into this, I do think that the Mineral Nutrition in Higher Plants is probably the best textbook. It is actually formerly a college agronomy textbook on the, su on the subject. It's a serious endeavor, but you can use it as an encyclopedia when you've got questions. All right. <clears throat> Um, phases of the nutritional need, first phase up to the first blossoming, you know, as the plants are getting established early, um, it's really important to have a good level of life, um, building in the, life in the soil. Um, plants need a highly functioning soil bacterial system to best establish themselves. Soil life needs water and sugar for starters. Dry soil or low bricks plants will short circuit this process. We talked about this. Um, we didn't talk about this. Low bricks. If you, um, what, I, I, what I should have said when I was talking about bricks is that your target level of bricks in the leaf is 12. You would like this number right here to be 12. The baseline, the lowest point in the, in the day should be 12. Um, anything below that and you consider yourself um, humble, yeah. <laughs> right? There are many people who feel cocky. Anybody know about these people who are cocky, right? A little bit a little bit arrogant, a little bit full of themselves. Anybody who's taken a refractometer out to their garden or to their field, wherever they go, um, and started taking readings um, has probably been humbled by the readings you get. Because 12 was your target, you're like, oh, I might be 9 or 10. No, you're 3 or 4. <laughs> right? It's embarrassing, actually, how sickly our plants are. And it's a really wonderful challenge getting those mixed readings up. Um, again, you dehydrate your plants. If they're wilted, you get a false high bricks. That doesn't count. A bricks of 10 when your plants are wilted is, is, a, is not a, is not a, is not a, a high bricks reading. Um, so anyways, if you do have low bricks readings in your leaves, if it is a cloudy, rainy kind of spring, you understand that the low bricks reading means probably the plant's not making as much sugar as it could. The one really easy way to cover for that and just still keep the soil life fed is to take some molasses, take some sugar, and water it through your drip line, to water it through your hose, to irrigate with it. You can really cheat with a little bit of sugar to help stimulate the overall system um, if it's not working. Ideally, you should be figuring out what's going wrong, why it's not working, and hoping to address that systemically. But a, a crisis management process is to put some sugar through the line. Absolutely. Um, and if the soil is dry and the soil life is dying off, then you need to irrigate. That's the point I want to make with this slide. Subsequently, as the plant begins to um, flower and fruit and go through its reproductive phase, um, the nutritional demands increase. I've got written boron, calcium, manganese, sulfur, phosphorus, mag magnesium, cobalt are all needed. Really, uh, you, a full spectrum is, is quite nice. Um, I like to um, use the metaphor of giving your kids their vitamins as an um, excuse to feed my plants on a regular basis. So I'm not sure how many people here have children. Um, there's this idea of cod liver oil, there's vitamin C, there's multivitamin. Um, there's a concept that, you know, our food does not have everything in it 
that our children need to flourish and supplement in their diet with supplements um, is sort of like a good insurance policy. So if you understand that concept, um, then the question is, is there any reason why you should not be applying that concept to your plants? And for me, I found that if I do go through the process of giving a prophylactic you know, multivitamin to my plants on a regular basis, it seems like they do much more well continuously, and I don't really have to be that good of a farmer to get plants that flourish much more readily. Yes. So you do this in the fall, you remineralize in the fall. Yes. And then during the And cover crop and, and minimal yeah. tillage and mulching and right. hydration and all the right. other stuff. All yes. Together. Inoculation. Inoculation. Don't forget the foundational stuff. Do that, <coughs> then you then cheat. Sometime during the growing season, you're going to go back through with these that we just listed. So you can make yourself a mix of liquids that, uh, a liquid that's got all these things in it. You can put a little bit of copper sulfate in it, a little bit of magnesium, a little bit of sulfur, a little bit of potassium, and you can put together a multivitamin, or you can buy one off the shelf just as easily, or maybe more easily, um, and feed it to your plants, you know, a, cup, a quart per acre or a half a gallon per acre, a pint in a foliar spray. Not, you don't need to put much down. Ideally, you've got your biologicals in there too, but really to sort of prophylactically feed your plants for anything that's a high value crop. If you're talking about making thousands of dollars per acre, it's gonna cost you $10 per acre to feed them on a weekly basis. For me, the cost benefit analysis is categorical. I'm so lazy that I don't get around to it most times, but if I ever do feel like, like pushing the envelope where I'm like, uh-oh, I got more orders next week than I got production, oh, I better feed my plants a little bit. Um, it doesn't take very long to kick them into gear. The leaves start to look a little bit, you know, not so shiny, starting to get a little bit haggard around the edges. Start feeding your plants, they go right back to shiny. You don't really have to be that good of a farmer, is my experience. Um, it's a good, it's a good, you know, we'll call it a, um, a transition phase. Um, w the ideal is that we're moving to a point where we don't need to be adding anything to our land, where the plants are so vigorous that they, and the soil is in such good shape that you put them in and they grow and everything's fine. That's where we're aiming to be. That's what the Native Americans are doing. That would be proper, that would be proper agriculture. But between here and there, we understand that we're operating in you know, not optimally functioning environments, and we want to be supporting them and um, not being too ethically pure, necessarily. Um, you, know, you just want to actually help grow healthy plants now. I think it's a good idea. What kind of so, foliar sprays? What kind of foliar sprays? Um, I don't usually talk about products, but I've already violated my... Go ahead, violate. Um, I've, already, I've, I've, already, I've already crossed the line. You know, at this point, it's like... <laughs> I'm already cheating, I might as well cheat all the way here and get it over with. Um, Jerry Brunetti has put together a really nice suite of liquids that, um, there's one called Plant Sure, which is a mix of the calcium and the potassium and the phosphorus and the magnesium and the trace elements and the, you know, everything. So I use that basically as a, as a general purpose prophylactic. Um, well, yeah, I mean, depending on how responsible I'm being, I won't do it for two and a half months, or I'll do it on a weekly basis. Um, so pro when people come to me and say, Dan, I don't want to take the course, just tell me what to do. I give them that basic fertilizer, I give them an inoculant, and I give them the plant sure, and I say, you know, 50 pounds per thousand square feet of the basic fertilizer, you know, uh, we do, you know, heavy-duty dose if you're up and on a small garden is like a cup per thousand square feet of concentrate. Like, that. do that on a weekly basis, and up they go, and off they take off. These people come back. They people get really worked up when they get like five pound, you know, sweet potatoes and you know, eighty-five pounds of tomatoes on a plant. You know, they get really excited. They just get really, really excited. They come back and they're just like so joyful. It makes me feel good. Anyways, it's cheating, right? You don't really need to know what you're doing. But if you feed the plants well, they grow vigorously. And there's one guy from Connecticut last year. And he just was so excited. He said he'd gotten 55 or 60 pounds of fruit off each tomato plant, and he had another 20 or 30 pounds on the plants when the frost killed them in October. And he was working in you know land that would have been previously very much of a sandy, very sandy, light kind of a soil. Um, so he was, yeah. Whatever, I got thousands of stories. But the, yeah, the idea is basically establishing good environmental conditions. You wanna be working on these systemic, systemic pieces of the puzzle, but then in season, if you feed your plants, um, it's really helpful. Depending on your economics, depending on what kind of you know, amount of money you wanna spend per acre, what kind of money you can earn per acre, um, you know, every dollar spent should 
give you ten dollars in return or something along those lines. It should be something along those lines or, or maybe more. Uh, root and top balance we talked about, conductivity we talked about, bricks we talked about. The only thing I didn't say about bricks was that um, when you're taking your, your bricks, regular bricks readings on the leaf, uh, you always want to take it in the same part of the plant, not the top of the plant one week, bottom of the plant the next week. I've got written here fourth newest leaf, which is ideally like the first fully formed leaf, the newest fully formed leaf. Same part, time of the day, same part of the, same part of the plant. Framing and fruiting, yield potential. Um, um, so this is basically arguing for the saturated paste test, these next few slides. The idea here is basically that um, um, you can test the soil in season to see what's available and what's not. We talked about the base test yesterday, which was the what's not present in the soil. This test is what's available and what's not. So I like use the metaphor of the savings account versus the checking account. Yesterday's re report conversation was about the um, savings account. This one is about the checking account. You may have calcium in the soil, but it's not available. So it doesn't really matter if it's present. The question is what's available. So uh, if you are the kind of person who wants to be using tests and labs and reports, um, the saturated paste test is the other box you can check on the Logan test, um, which will tell you what's available right now in season. And I've got the metrics on the top of page nine. It's not, it's a weak, it's a weak acid soil test. Oh, it's, it's telling you what's available right now to go into the plant, which should correlate with your SAP test in a week. And they can't just do it in water? Do it, in water. Uh, it might be a water test. I'm not sure how they do it. Saturated paste test target levels are on the top of page nine. Um, simple solutions slide is telling you that if you do foliar sprays and drenches on a regular basis, things are likely to do better. And the biological process slide is, re is a reminder of what we talked about yesterday, which was the correlation between um, the complexing of compounds and pest and disease resistance in the plants. Um, and this biology chemistry is where I like to start my last section of the day. Are you guys up for a quick break? Quick, quick question. So, all quick right. question. <laughs> page yes. tells you what versus what the saturated paste test tells The first page, the one we talked about yesterday, yeah. tells you what is and what is not present in the soil. Okay. The other one tells you what's available to the plant right now. So that doesn't really matter right now because you don't have anything growing. Right. So you want to do that, you know, two or three weeks after you put the plants in the ground as they're about to, you know, bulk up. Yeah. That's the time of the year when you want to say, what's not available because I have plants are about to hit puberty and I want them to build strong adult bones. What can I, what, if I, what can I amend with to help address deficiencies? And, um, and we're also going to learn something about the biological community through that, right? Uh, it's not a biological assay. It's a mineralogical I assay. Know, but from your reasoning. If you're, in, you put the if you like logic, in conversation yes. And you know, if you know the biology, like yes. my teacher is a biology into me. Yes. And I, I ran that as far as it goes, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> this one over here has the same problem. Yeah. Oh, I solved that problem in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing the minerals about Started using minerals. I only spent about a year doing all 1,500 acres before I figured it out. <laughs> it was still a year of my life. Yes. A lot of repetition. And thousands of dollars in tests. And then I met somebody to help me. You know, yeah. he, he was doing the biology minerals. Microbes and minerals, M and M's, yeah. M and M's, yeah. <clears throat> um, quick break. <laughs>